Ah, good, we're recording. So, folks, I hate to say it, but there's uh, some uh, errors in this week's reading. And I think I feel obliged to address them. So, now, some of these errors, I must admit, um, perhaps I am come from a uh, special place because I am essentially a scholar of world religions, uh, whereas our writer seems to be more focused specifically on the philosophy of religion. I'm not sure how much uh, he has um, explored other religious traditions. So uh, as a result, I'm coming from a more global perspective. I read this and I'm thinking, um, yeah, but what about this tradition, that tradition, etc. So let's make a beginning. And um, on page 161 of my copy of the text, which is the third edition, um, our author states, thus far, we have not focused our attention on any particular religion. Um, instead, we have considered the basic feature that is common to the religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Okay, I'm sorry, folks, but some observations about that. First, I think he's been a bit disingenuous, so that, that would be the most generous way to put it, uh, because uh, the traits that he associates with the theistic God um, are specifically, and very specifically, those of the Abrahamic God. Um, I, let me turn to my PowerPoint, because I have some images to help illustrate the points that I want to make. Oh, here we go. So, So as I said, I come from the context of uh, a world religions framework. And so I study all of these religions to a greater or lesser extent and more. Um, whereas our author seems to be clearly focused on the Abrahamic traditions. So, so more of the problem that he has been the problems he's been wrestling with are a direct result of that the specific configuration of traits that we find in the Abrahamic religions, the notion that of a God that is omniscient, omnipotent, and omnibenevolent. So, for example, mysticism is not problematic in traditions that are experiential as opposed to faith-based. For example, shamanism. Buddhism and oh, and yoga. Now, moreover, the problem of evil is not a problem in traditions that assume that either deity does not intervene in human experience, such as Epicureanism or deism, or um, that deity is not all powerful, such as those in Hinduism or the ancient Greco Roman, Roman religion, traditions that are non theistic, like Buddhism, traditions where the divine is understood as a force rather than as a personality, or traditions which assume that either the deity or the demiurge is actually malevolent, such as man uh, Gnosticism in general and Manichaeism in particular. Now, Similarly, the credibility of miracles is only an issue in traditions where it's assumed that God can, has, and may intervene in the human experience. Um, issues of an afterlife only attach to traditions which believe in a personal afterlife. Hinduism and Buddhism anticipate absorption of the individual in the state of nirvana. 
but you do not continue as an individual soul. You become one with the universal soul when you attain nirvana. There are even traditions that have no explicit teaching about the afterlife, such as Confucianism. Moreover, the notion that God has foreknowledge of not only everything that has happened, but also everything that is ever going to happen, seems to me to be likely a legacy of Platonism. Traditions that have not been influenced by Platonism that I've studied seem not to have that notion. Finally, not all religions assume a personal godhead. In Taoism, for example, the Tao is a force rather than personality. Um, our author's notion of deity as being outside of time, I think is actually more consistent with Taoism than with Christianity, because a being that is outside of time, how could you have a personal relationship with it? Finally, all of his major sources seem to be Abrahamic, and many, if not most, are specifically Christian, and many of those Christian sources, such as St. Augustine, and Thomas Aquinas are specifically known primarily as theologians, not as philosophers. Then, in you know, they might be considered philosophers secondarily. What he has been referring to via various euphemisms, such as Western religious tradition or classical Western tradition, or under the general title of theism, is very specifically. Um, Abrahamic theism, or specifically Christian theism, making this textbook, I, I hate to tell you this, uh, effectively more work of theology than of philosophy. And speaking for myself as a world religion scholar, I have to think that a lot of these problems could have been settled much more elegantly, efficiently, and in accordance with Roger of Occam's principle of parsimony, known as Occam's razor, by considering one or another of the many other types of theism I've shared with you in these announcements. On page 162, to his credit, our author quotes from the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, side note, uh, personal side note, but ironically, about 20, 35 years ago, uh, what opened my mind and interest in world religions was coming across the copy of the Bhagavad Gita. Um, that prompted me to study world religion since I found much more profound truth in just that one slim volume than all the religious texts I had been exposed to from the quote unquote Western religious tradition. That said, um, our author makes a significant omission when he talks about the notions in the Bhagavad Gita. He quotes from the Bhagavad Gita and states that the total devotion to divine being is claimed to be the best way to personal salvation. Well, that's not entirely correct. Um, Bhakti yoga is one of the important yogic paths mentioned in Bhagavad Gita. Um, it is the path of emotion. It is admittedly the most popular of the yogic paths precisely because since most people are primarily motivated by their emotions, for them, it is the most effective path towards liberation or salvation. However, it is not the only path nor even the path recommended by Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. Nana yoga is the intellectual path in which you use your, the mind to transcend the mind. It is considered the most difficult path precisely because our minds can so easily lead us astray. But for people who come from, more from their heads than their hearts, like uh, our, you know, scholars, is also the most suitable path. Karma yoga is the way of action and the preferred path for those who define themselves by their actions. Karma yoga is about doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do not in hopes of recognition or honor or desirable consequences. In fact, in the Bhagavad, Bhagavad Gita, that is the path that Krishna recommends to his friend Arjuna. Arjuna is a warrior. He's supposed to lead his people into battle, but on the opposite side of the battlefield, he are uh, people that he's related to. So he has a duty as a warrior to start this battle, but he also has a duty not to be the cause of the death of relatives. And 
he stops his battle chariot right in the middle of the battlefield and um, talks with his chariot driver, who just happens to be Krishna, an incarnation of Lord Vishnu, um, who gives him the advice that we find in the Bhagavad Gita. So I think it might be telling that our author only focuses with these three different paths. He fo only focuses on the devotional path because honestly, in modern practice, Christianity leans towards a devotional path. It's about the focus of one of total devotion on the figure of Jesus. But as I read the gospels, Jesus' message strikes me as being more consistent with karma yoga. He teaches that you should do the right thing because it's the right thing to do, not for the sake of reputation or public esteem or reward. There's an old saying, <clears throat> we don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. If our author is indeed, as he stated at the start of his chapter about predestination, a convert to an orthodox branch of Protestantism, it would make sense that reading the Bhagavad Gita, he would focus on the devotional rather than the intellectual, uh, nana or kinesthetic karma schools of yoga mentioned therein. On page 163, our author states, can all these religions be true if what they declare about divine reality, human existence, and um, and salvation, clearly not for they say incompatible things about these matters. After physical death, either human beings undergo reincarnation or they do not. Since religions differ on this matter, some must hold a false view. Logic requires that at least one of these claims is false. So as long as we regard these proclamations proclamations as purporting to state literal uh, truths about the way things are, not all religions can be true. Now, there's a couple things we need to unpack, unpack about that statement. On the one hand, our author is going all in on the, the tendency to dualism that we find in the Western tradition largely because I suspect of the influence of Aristotle's logic. Aristotle's logic is entirely based on either or statements, but there are other systems of logic that do not buy into dualism. In Jewish halakhic logic, for example, the notion isn't that there is a clear di dichotomy between spiritual truths, but rather that some ideas have qualitatively greater truth than others. So the old, joke in Judaism is that if you put five rabbis in a room and ask them to de debate a point of faith uh, or doctrine, when you come back, they will, you will find not five opinions, not four opinions, not three opinions, you will find 15 opinions, is the old joke. So, moreover, let me ask, must this be an either or matter? Could it be that some people reincarnate and some end up in some version of heaven or hell? But also, he seems to be buying into literalism. Not all religions read their scriptures literally. Many, most, read their scriptures more as philosophy or as poetry or as literature. For example, Buddhist sutras gain their authority not so much from their putative authorship. Most of them are anonymous, but rather from the fact that generation after generation has read these sutras in a particular Buddhist tradition and found them meaningful and significant. In Hinduism, there's a claim to divine authorship for the principal epics like the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. Most, but with the, the exception of those two, most of their scriptures are anonymous and similarly revered for their profundity rather than their putative semi-divine authorship. On page 163, our author states perhaps the most natural position for a believer in a particular rel religion to take is that the truth lies with her own religion and that any religion holding opposing views is therefore false. Uh, as a scholar of world religions, I see at least a couple things that are questionable about this statement. If that is so, 
why would it be that outside of the Abrahamic traditions, most religions are either inclusivist or pluralist? For example, Sikhism is the world's fifth largest religion. It doesn't claim that it is the one true religion. Its founder, Guru Nanak, famously stated that um, not calling Hindu, not calling Muslim. He stated this right after he had had a profound revelation. While that translates as neither Hindu or Muslim, he claimed a revelation that there was a singular truth that transcended all of these traditions. Specifically, Khalsa Sikhs, which are the ones who undergo the Sikh baptism, are technically inclusivists. They do not de deny that other religions are valid, but they, are, they own a personal commitment to the Sikh camp, which is why they um, affect the five Ks, the Kesh, the long hair and beard, the Kanga, the, um, the Kirpan, the Karo, and the Kachero. If you are a Khalsa Sikh and you undergo the Sikh baptism, you are required to wear all of these as a sign of your Sikh identity. But that doesn't mean that you consider all the religions to be wrong. You just have a, a personal commitment to your own path. Now, the distinction our author draws between exclusivism and inclusivism and pluralism is usually credited to John Hick. Uh, our author does make reference to Hick, Hick in passing, but I don't think he gives him direct or full credit. Now, a few more points I want to make that are what I would consider a wata. Um, various things that I believe deserve uh, clarification or elaboration. So, on the one hand, our author is correct that Catholicism post Vatican II is no longer exclusivist, it is inclusivist. <coughs> it officially takes the position that Catholicism has more truth than other religions, but doesn't say that other religions are involved. And in fact, that's why Pope Francis, after he was invested as the Pope, made a, has made a point of visiting both synagogues and mosques. Our author states that while denying the ultimate validity of other religions, the inclusivist Chris, Christian may still allow the, that other adherents of those other religions may gain salvation. Well, that's not entirely incorrect, but as I read John Hick, inclusivism is a bit broader. Inclusivists hold they've made a commitment to a tradition that has greater truth than others, but that does not in itself invalidate the other traditions. This is much the same position as the Khalsa Sikhs take. On one, page 167, our author states, we cannot experience the ultimate divine reality. But isn't that precisely what is uh, promised by experiential, mystical traditions? On page 168, our author refers to the classic parable, parable of the blind man and the elephant. But I don't think he gives uh, due credit. This is specifically a classic illustration of the concept of anakantavada, the notion that all truth is known from a particular perspective and no one individual human being knows all truth. This is a key concept in the religion of Jainism. On page 170, we find the statement that the title God is used by Christians refers to the heavenly father of Jesus Christ, but um, or doesn't that rather hand wave away the notion of the, the Trinity? The Nicene Creed states that the Son and the Holy Spirit are one in being with the Father. Uh, I think our author has inadvertently committed a, what's technically a heresy here. Now, being myself an omnist, I admit that I object to our author's portraying an either or proposition as to whether we can reconcile the world's religions with each other. Ultimately, however, I think this comes down to what we call sorting theory. Um, given examples of things that have equal degrees of similarity and dissimilarity, uh, such as, let's say, a choice between a nickel and dime, 
Some people default on focusing on the dissimilarities and some people focus by default on the similarities. To those of us that are ominous, the dissimilarities can be traced to different emphasis or priorities in different societies. But another way, the similarities outweigh the dissimilarities. For example, as I read world religions, all religions share the notions of some kind of deity and teaching that we should treat others the way we want to be treated. Those seem to be universal. Most, maybe a majority, moreover, are from some kind of an afterlife, and that there is a linkage between whether we follow the golden rule and what we experience in the context of the afterlife. Now, this might account for the dis dissimilarities I noticed previously in near death experiences. People experience the divine in the context of the traditions they grew up. So Christians, for example, who have a near death experience are likely to see Jesus. Hindus having a near death experience would be more likely to see Vishnu or perhaps Shiva or even Krishna. Each engages with the divine in the context of his own understanding. Uh, I think this is following, consistent with the following two observations I would like to share with you. If we are finite and deity is infinite, doesn't that suggest that we as individuals would engage with deity within the context of our own understanding and cultural systems? And if so, doesn't it make sense that people engaging with the infinite coming from different religious traditions would experience it and talk about it in a manner coherent with their own social and historical context. So, I'm sorry folks, this has been a longer than usual announcement, I admit, um, but let me point out that in academe, none of us can claim absolute truth. I do think our author has given a pretty good exposition of the philosophy of religion in the context of Abrahamic traditions. I just wish he would um, cop to that a little more clearly and directly. But as a scholar myself of world religions, I felt obliged to comment on the lacunae in our text, both in terms of other major philosophical important theisms in world religions, and also our author's neglect of important pre-Christian philosophers and theologians. Uh, as I've read the text, it seems like his um, body of knowledge when it comes to uh, philosophy and religion uh, only goes back to about the fourth century CE and books. There was so, so much that was established and continues to grow down to this day starting a good thousand years before the fourth century. So thoughts, observations, have my uh, announcements here been thought provoking? And uh, let me just be whimsical for a moment. What do you think? Should I work on sending a proposal to an academic publisher to perhaps um, write a response to this text, but taking a world religion view of the philosophy of religion. Don't get me wrong, if you want to understand the uh, philosophy of religion from the context, very specifically of the Abrahamic traditions, our author's been pretty good. But there is so, so much more in terms of philosophy of religion, world religions, philosophy, um, and um, I've been trying to fill in the gaps as we've been going along. So that's what I have to say. I'm still working through my way through the readings that were put up as PDFs. So, and I'm making notes as I'm reading them. I might have one more announcement. We'll see, um, making comments about those readings. We'll see if there's any huge gaps I encounter. So there's my thoughts for this week. Ciao.